It's ironic that today in 2022, we have access to more information at our fingertips than ever before in history, while at the same time, it's arguably one of the most confusing times to be alive. Let that sink in for just a moment, just how ironic it is, all of the information literally at our fingertips, and we have never been more confused. I, I Look, I'm right there with you on many, many levels. One level, however, that I find myself having more and more clarity every day is on being a pet parent. Now, I'm in no way perfect. Uh, never, ever would I suggest that. However, I do feel confident as a pet parent, and I think that is something that a lot of pet parents don't necessarily feel. They don't necessarily feel the confidence that I, I hope you can feel one day. So let's talk about that today. Let's talk about how to find your confidence as a pet parent. Oh, oh. <laughs> Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Now that was a big, big introduction and I am in no way, shape or form think that by the end of today's episode, you're going to be bursting with all the confidence in the world, but I do hope to be setting you on the right path for success to find that confidence in being a pet parent. Truth be told, I'm probably going to ebb and flow between some really easy to understand ideas and some more in-depth ideas that you may feel a little uncomfortable listening to, but stick with me because I feel it's all important and I'm going to do my best to keep those really in depth, more psychological (laughs) theories to a minimum in an effort to make sure that this particular podcast episode can be as effective as possible. Now, the reason that I wanted to do this episode, the reason that that put the thought in my mind that I, I, I needed to interject a solo episode in between all of these amazing interview episodes that are on the podcast right now, and if you haven't caught up with all of the interviews, I hope you do so because, oh my goodness, it, it is just jam-packed with some amazing guests. But I wanted to interject this solo episode because this has really been heavy uh, on on me, on my heart, and a lot of other people in the healthy pet space I know um, have really been feeling it too. And I, I, I say, I call it the healthy pet space because we are looking for out of the box solutions to everyday problems. That doesn't necessarily mean that other people in the pet space who are not more holistically, um, functionally, integratively inclined aren't interested in the health of pets. They absolutely are, just in a different way. They haven't awoken yet to the idea that there is more out there that can and absolutely is beneficial in a healthy, happy life for our pets. That's truly my belief, is that they just haven't awoken to it yet. Now, there will be a portion of that population that that never awakens to it. There will be um, a vast majority of the population that kind of flounders in between. They just don't know. And this episode is kind of, my hope is to help people in that middle ground, in that middle space, realize that they don't have to flounder in that middle ground. And then also the people who are already like on the fence, they're, they're dipping their toes into alternative uh, therapies and medicine. You know, Dr. Katie Woodley said it best, and I am paraphrasing here, food, what we feed to ourselves and our pets, can either be the safest form of medicine or the slowest form of poison. Now, 
this is not all related to medicine. Um, this is not all related to food. This is not all related to flea and tick. This is not all related to any one thing. I think the concept that I want to get across to you today can be applied universally. And I do hope you take my thought today, what I, what I want to tell you, the words I have for you today, and you really start to think on it for some time and see not only how we can make positive changes that affect our pets, but also that affect ourselves and our families and our homes and our home life. I kind of got off, off on a tangent there, but the reason that I wanted to talk to you about this today is because myself and others in the healthy pet space have really felt the brunt the aggression from a lot of people in the, uh, the veterinary profession, not just veterinarians, but other people in the profession of veterinary medicine. Oh, they have just been very, very aggressive lately. This isn't new. It's kind of cyclical. It comes and it goes. Um, they they kind of make the rounds between all of the people in the healthy pet space, but I, I, and I am in no way saying that we don't need our, we absolutely need our veterinarians. We, we love our veterinarians. We want to work with our veterinarians. And the fact that so many of us have been, are being attacked <laughs> and really, it, it really hurts us because all we do is care about the pets. All we do is care about the animals. And when someone comes at us saying that we don't, it hurts us to our core. And so that's really one of the reasons that I, I wanted to talk to you today and bring you this solo episode. Um, because all of this comes from a place of fear. Every time somebody attacks someone else online or in person, but we see it so profoundly like it is just exponentially happening online it is all because of fear and we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute but let's first talk about why our veterinarians are important what they are incredible incredible um, resources for us they care most of them care deeply about the pets you know there's for most of them, there's not a whole lot of money in it, so they're not there for the money, though they do have to make money to keep their business open. And what, what I want you to understand is that veterinarians are exceptional. They excel at helping our pets in ways that we can't. They know how to fix our dog that was hit by a car, right? Our dog has a broken bone to the vet we go. They are great at that. They are great when our cat gets attacked by another animal. Absolutely, we need to get into that vet right away. If, heaven forbid, our cat becomes, you know, they're, they have a urinary blockage, absolutely, we need to get into our veterinarian right away. They are, that is what they are there for. They are exceptional at fixing our animals. At emergency medicine, at maybe your dog gets into the trash and swallows an avocado pit, Absolutely, into the veterinarian we go. There are lots of things that our veterinarians are exceptional at. They know back to front, whisker to tail as they say, how to manage and handle all of these things for our pets. One thing they are not great at, they just, and it's not their fault, they are not taught how to do is nutrition and preventative medicine, so to prevent disease. These are things that they are not taught about. They, and, and this isn't exclusive of our veterinarians. This is also true in human medicine. Our doctors for humans are not taught about nutrition, are not taught of preventive medicine. They are excellent in fixing things that go wrong in the body. They are not great at helping you prevent things go wrong in the body. So that's what our veterinarians excel at and one of the reasons that i wanted to kind of bring this up is because it's our responsibility as pet parents to curate a team for our pets and our veterinarians are an essential part of that team however we're the head of that team 
and we have to become more knowledgeable. Does this mean that you have to know how to set a bone on your dog or cat? No, absolutely not. That is why we are curating a team that includes our wonderful veterinarians, right? Because that is not what we do. We did not go to vet school. We don't know these things. But there are other things, and, and this, is, this is really what I wanted to hit home in today's episode, is that there are lots of things in the world, there is lots of knowledge out there that you can have as a pet parent that I know I have that my veterinarian doesn't necessarily have. And that's okay because that's not what they were taught how to do. You don't have to be a veterinarian to know anything about your pets, right? One of the things that I see posted more often than anything else is you're not a veterinarian. No, I absolutely am not a veterinarian. I have never claimed to be. I don't even play one on TV. That doesn't mean I can't know things. I absolutely know things. It doesn't mean you can't know things. You absolutely can know things. You can know that chicken and rice isn't what you want to feed your dog when they have an upset stomach. Chicken is fine, maybe if your dog doesn't have a sensitivity to it, and so many dogs do because of the poor quality ingredients found in most uh, feed, which I'll say food, but it's feed, available to pet parents in the United States and around the world. But rice, absolutely not. We do not want to feed rice, especially to a dog who has GI upset. No, instead we wanna feed, uh, me personally, I would prefer cooked ground turkey and some cooked pumpkin. Yeah, that's going to be so much better in helping my dog. I'm providing them with a bland diet, but I'm also giving them the tools in the pumpkin or sweet potato, I do sweet potato a lot too. So these are things that I don't need my veterinarian for, right? Yeah, if, if they're stomach upset, persists even though I've put them on a bland diet for two or three days maybe I do want to pop into my veterinarian because there's something more going on that I don't know about but there are things that I can know and I don't have to be a veterinarian to know them so putting together a team I'm trying I'm sorry if I'm getting a little like off in tangents here but putting together a team you may have a regular veterinarian that you see for Um, annual blood draws, if you need an x-ray done, that kind of thing, a urinalysis that you go to and they're a traditional or allopathic veterinarian, absolutely, but you may also have an integrative or a functional or a holistic veterinarian that you do telehealth with, that you use in combination with your allopathic or traditional medicine veterinarian right? You may also have a veterinarian who does acupuncture for you. You may also have a holistic health practitioner who does muscle testing for your pets. You may also have a canine nutritionist on board that you consult with from time to time or you get meal plans done from to make your own food at home for your pets. There are lots of different uh, people that you can have on your team to help you take the absolute best care of your pet and that's okay in fact that's that is absolutely what we should be doing you don't go to one doctor your entire life do you no your pet shouldn't either now I told you I was going to talk a little bit about fear and now's the time we're going to do that because what I have learned and and here's where I'm going to get a little bit deeper into human psychology and Forgive me if this isn't something that you want to hear, but I think it's important for you to hear it, so stick with me. Every adult that you deal with today in life is reacting in a way that was set in motion when they were a child. There is one critical point in every human's life when they are a child when they ask their parent why to everything. Why this, why that? Why do I need to brush my teeth? Why do I need to brush my hair? Why do I need to go to school? Why do I need to eat this? Why can't I eat that? They are asking why about everything. And there is one crucial point in every child's life where that parent or parents have to at some point say, I don't know. 
and every every parent may approach that differently and I'm not here to I'm not here to tell parents how to how to parent their children so there may be a lot of different ways in which parents react in this particular instance but for that child what is important is that this is the first time in their lives that they start to realize that their parents are not all-knowing and what happens is that that quickly that child quickly extrapolates that information into I'm not, I can't possibly be all-knowing because I get all of my information from my parents. And then they extrapolate, extrapolate that to no one in the world is all-knowing because my parent isn't all-knowing, that parent isn't all-knowing, that parent is all, isn't all-knowing, which means I'm not all-knowing and this child isn't all-knowing and this child. So there is this conflict now that has never existed. And forgive me, I'm trying to kind of give you the 10,000 foot view of this. I, I did train in human psychology. That is my, um, was my field of study, but I try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, not just for your sake, but for mine (laughs) and in every child's life, this is a very crucial turning point because they have a couple of options and they only have a couple of options. They can either become very fearful because they don't know and their parents don't know and oh my gosh who does know nobody knows oh my lord jesus right and these fearful children want structure they want x to equal y all of the time there are no gray areas they need it to stay out of the fear zone right or or they can take this new information and say become very incredibly creative and imaginative and realize that they can go off and learn about things their parents don't know about. They can learn and they can better themselves and eventually the world. They can become incredible artists. Um, They can become incredible scholars. They can become very creative in life instead of becoming very fearful. So children generally follow one of these two trajectories. Now, a lot of work can be done as an adult to heal childhood trauma and to change trajectory in your life. You may have been very, and this is honestly something that I have gone through. I used to be very fearful and I have done quite a bit of work on myself to become very creative. And this is a very simplistic view, but I used to be that person that wanted X to equal Y all the time. I wanted a pill for every ill. I I, I would have told you, go outside, ooh, no way, right? Connecting with nature, oh my gosh, why would I want to do that? Because I was a very fearful child. I have been able to realize that about myself and deprogram and relearn a lot of things to become more creative and realize that X doesn't have to equal Y. Now, that's kind of a long way around me telling you that a lot of people, not everybody online is negative, by the way. We just see that and it hurts so much more. That's the way our brains work as humans. We can have a hundred, you're wonderful, everything is great, oh my gosh, thank you so much, and one person says that was horrible, and that one person is what's going to stick with us. That's the way our brains work, and it's unfortunate, but it is the way it is. Everybody's brain works the same. And don't let anybody fool you into saying that it doesn't. You can work on yourself to focus, refocus on the positive um, and understand how much it outweighs the negative, but our brain is designed to focus on the negative because of our survival instinct. We want to squash the negative uh, at all possible adjuncts, right? Uh, and we just can't do that in today's world, so it, it, it eats away at us. But we, we focus on the negative. I only say that because Yes, there are people out there who are very mean and very aggressive and very troll-like on social media, um, and their voices tend to stand out even though they are the minority. 
Today's episode is brought to you by the Furry Family Coach Dog Training. Train your dog in the comfort of your own home and on your schedule with video instruction from me. Learn the foundations of training, teach basic cues to your dog, and explore solutions to behavioral issues all inside of this video-based online training course. Go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to see you on the inside. These people are coming from a place of fear. So I personally like to when I see a negative post, when I see a negative comment, when I see somebody tell me you're not a veterinarian, I know I'm not, I'm, I've never claimed to be a veterinarian, but what I try to do is be more empathetic and realize that these people are coming from a place of fear. And how do I want to react to and talk to someone who is coming from a place of fear? I don't want to come at them with more negativity that's not going to help, right? So. That's the kind of the reason why I wanted to, I, I first started thinking about today's episode and, and want you to also realize because you even, I have no idea if you're a content creator or if you're a pet parent trying to consume as much information as possible to do better for your pet or both, right? So I don't know to what extent you may be seeing comments like this or to what extent you may see comments like this on creators posts where you are like, you have a lot of faith in this creator. Let's just say Dr. Judy Morgan. Let's say you have a lot of faith in Dr. Judy Morgan and then all of a sudden you see a lot of negative posts on, um, on her page and on her videos. If that gets you to think, Oh man, I wonder, should I, sh am I, should I be following her? Like, is she really telling me the right thing or not? That's getting, they're getting you to question what you know to be true, what you believe in your heart. That's their goal. I understand that. But what I want you to know is to be true to yourself. Okay. They are coming from a place of fear. You at one point, I'm sure, had all the fear they currently have, and you have surpassed, you have learned your way past the fear, right? You have educated yourself past the fear. So we need to help these other people as much as we can. If they don't wanna learn it, we can't make them learn it, but we need to help these people as much as we can learn their way past the fear as well. Trust in yourself that you have found a content creator, again, I'm just gonna, for sake of um, example, I'm gonna say Dr. Judy Morgan, you have found a creator that resonates with you, who gives a shit about the animals, who is just trying their best to provide good information to you. Don't let all those fear mongers dissuade you from what you know to be true. And really interestingly, I'm gonna be talking, I. I I don't, I guess Dr. Judy was on my brain because I'm going to be talking to Gwen Campbell, who is Dr. Judy's daughter, um, on an upcoming episode. So make sure if you're not already following the podcast that you do go ahead and follow it because you want to get a notification when that uh, airs. Gwen and I are going to be talking about how to consume short form content on social media as a pet parent. I think that it's an incredible topic that as a pet parent, you don't want to miss because we are at a point where we as creators have to create short form content to survive. And for me, being a content creator, I feel like that is incredibly difficult. How do you take a really complex issue and boil it down to 60 seconds? Oh my goodness. It's like for, for some things, I don't think it's possible, but we're going to be talking to Gwen about that <laughs> in another episode. So I'm really excited to be bringing that to you. I hope you're really excited to hear it. One thing I really want you to know, and I, I hope I have, I hope I haven't gone too much into the deep end. I haven't gone off the deep end too much with you. Um, one thing that I really want you to know is that 
it is always okay to ask questions. I want you to ask questions, not just of me, of any and everyone that you follow. Because one, that's the best way we're going to learn. Um, but two, it's keeping us all in check, really. Like, and, and for me, selfishly, it, it lets me know what to create content on when you ask questions. But keep asking questions. Find your trusted resources and keep asking questions. Now, okay, I get it. I hear you. You're saying, Jessica, I get it. When you know better, you do better. Absolutely. How do I find those trusted resources? First of all, I'm thrilled that you're here with me. I hope that you can consider me as a trusted resource. Um, not because I'm a veterinarian, I'm gonna tell you right up front I'm not, but because I do the work. I put in the work and research to find the best possible information, whether that is an allopathic route or more of a functional medicine, holistic homeopathic route, I'm looking for the absolute best possible for you and your pets. So I hope you consider me a trusted resource, but there are lots of wonderful resources out there, veterinarian and not veterinarian. Um, some of my favorites are, again, Dr. Judy Morgan. Uh, Dr. Melissa Shelton is my go-to for essential oils. Um, Dr. Lori Kozier has a real, I mean, she's got a lot of great information. She has a, her healthy dog workshop has a wonderful um, vaccination protocol for puppies and kittens that I love. Dr. Will Falconer, I go to him for homeopathy, for, um, again, vaccinations, for heartworm. Um, there are so many more that I can't think of necessarily off the top of my head. Uh, Angela Ardolino is my go-to for CBD. If you missed that episode, make sure to go back and listen to that. She was amazing. Dr. Odette Souter and her seven pillars of health. Love that. And uh, that's a very short list, but there are so many more. Curating your own. Kimberly Gautier. I've had her on the podcast twice and she is incredible. She's not a veterinarian, but she knows a sh ton about raising healthy dogs and raw feeding dogs. The two crazy cat ladies are wonderful for cat advice. So, you know, there's, there's, there are a lot of creators out there who are putting out really wonderful content for you because they care about your pets. Um, so find your trusted resources and ask questions. Another thing that I really want to touch on, and I'm not going to be too long-winded on this, is all of the people coming at me and others in, this, in the healthy pet space about where are the studies, where are the studies, where are the studies. One thing that I want you to know, and this is something that I have wrestled with quite a bit with my background in, um, in science. I decided not to pursue my degree in psychology um, primarily because I just didn't want to hear people complain all day every day. <laughs> I realized that by the time I was probably in my last semester um, of undergrad and but but one thing that I really want you to know well there are a bunch of things first and foremost is that back in 2005 a lot of editors of publications for peer-reviewed research uh, came out and said, you cannot trust these peer-reviewed studies. There are a number of reasons for that, a lot of which revolves around the fact that science has become an ideology in our society. Um, if you really want to, if you truly believe in science, the basis, the foundation of science is to question yourself, is to keep asking questions, is to prove yourself wrong. When you set out, one of the most basic things you learn in the study of science is that when you go about, when you set up a study, you are not, never, setting up a study to prove yourself right, to prove your theory right. In fact, it is the opposite. You set up a study to prove your theory wrong. And if you can't prove your theory wrong, then by doing so, you assume your theory to be correct. Now, through, through time, others may come and find your research and say, mm, I'm not sure if that 
is true anymore and they do more research to again prove that theory wrong. That is the true basis, the foundation of science. Where we stand today, we have turned science into religion. We have turned science into an ideology where it, we live in a society where you either publish or perish, meaning if you are a scientist, you have to publish research or you lose. You're done. You don't get paid. You don't get funding. You lose your job wherever you may be um, employed, whether that is at a university or um, a pharmaceutical company, wherever it may be. And people today are conducting scientific studies to prove their theories right, which is the exact opposite of what science truly is. Not only that, they are, they are being paid in many cases by pharmaceutical companies and others, um, lobbyists to prove that a new product or drug or food is okay to sell. That is not real science. Um, I believe in science and I believe in questioning everything because that is what science is. And when, when you turn science into an ideology, you have lost science. And that's where we are today. There has never been a correction to this. Um, it's been going on for a very long time. It was very widely uh, publicized in 2005 where these you know, editors of journals who are publishing these peer-reviewed research studies came out and said, look, this isn't science anymore, guys. This is not, you cannot trust these peer-reviewed studies and, and nobody seems to care. Nobody has done anything about it. Um, so when somebody says to me, where's the study? I say, Fi follow the money. And people look at me and they come back at me and say, that's, that's too cynical. That's not a good answer. I appreciate that is very cynical, but it's also the truth. Um, so yeah, I would love, I would love to show you the studies and you know what? There are some good studies out there. I'm not saying that there, no study is any good. Um, it's what we currently have and we need to work with it as best as we can. But I also think we need to shift our focus and realize that when you have a peer-reviewed study that the the results of that study cannot be replicated which in forgive me if I get this incorrect I want to say it is 83 um, percent according to the journals the editors of the journals who have gone back through the research I want to say it's 83 percent of the studies uh, that are published as peer-reviewed, their results cannot be replicated. That's not science. That is not something that should be published. Um, anyway, that's, that's something to think about. So that's my long-winded answer to where's the study. <laughs> I don't really care about the study. I, I appreciate that any evidence I may have is anecdotal, but that's where science starts is with anecdotal evidence. And when we have hundreds and thousands of pet parents who are getting the same anecdotal evidence, that then in itself becomes an observational study. And if there were someone who had the money to put all of this um, observational evidence together to create a study, and maybe there's somebody out there doing it, uh, you know, we could really have some really great studies going on out there because all of this anecdotal, anecdotal uh, evidence is also observational data. So we can we can choose to look at it in a negative light or we can choose to look at it in a positive light. And I choose to look at it in a positive light because I am seeing lots of positive effects and not just my animals, but animals across the country and across the world who are being raised with more holistically minded pet parents who are thriving. So, yeah, all of that, I hope, makes sense to you. <laughs> These are my ramblings. Um, and I, I hope that it resonates with you because it's truly coming from my heart because I care about you and because I care about your pets. 
do with it what you will, what you want, um, take it or leave it, but I do hope it makes a positive impression in your life and the life of your pet. So I'm going to go ahead and end today's episode, but make sure you are, if you're not already following, if there are some really great uh, interviews that I've posted in the past, there are more great interviews to come. Make sure you're following the podcast and go to the petparentingreset.com because there are um, there's an opt-in there. If you don't already have my free beginner dog training series, you can get on um, that list, get in that free membership. Um, there's also some free downloads there for you. So go to the petparentingreset.com and I'll talk to you next week. Bye guys. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. Make sure that you're following the show so you never miss an episode. And please take a moment to rate the show on your podcast app. I'd also love it if you'd share this podcast with your friends and family so that they can benefit from the information to help their pets live long, happy lives too. Don't forget to take advantage of this special discount as a listener today and get access to over 100 online videos and my online dog training the Furry Family Coach. Just go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code PODCAST at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to have you join and see you on the inside. Oh, oh, oh.